does it. It's cool. It's good that we had that problem because otherwise we would have had no audio today, which would have been unfortunate, but not unprecedented. <laughs> Would anyone like to begin with a word of prayer? All right, go ahead, Mr. P. So, any questions? Well, preferably linear algebra. Um, I guess it depends on the question, right? If I say find an isomorphism, it's not, you don't have to prove that it's injective and surjective, you just have to find an isomorphism, right? So I've freed you of the technical nuances of showing it's an injective, surjective map. Um, to actually show it, well, you got to show it. I mean, there, it depends on the details, but, uh, you know, I mean, there are different things that you could... To show it's injective, you can calculate the kernel. Um, if you, I mean, I just, I should, there's lots and lots of different things that can happen there, so I shouldn't try to give you the lay of the land. But do be, a, do be you know, if I say find, right, so for example, find an isomorphism, from G, I don't know, how about C two by two um, to, I don't know, R four by four. Um, and this, of course, is as a real vector space. I'm not sure this even makes sense. Let's see if my problem even makes sense. What's, what, what's, what's, the, what's the dimension of C2 by 2 as a real vector space? Would it be 8? Yeah, because you've got like Z1, Z12, Z21, Z22. So let's see here. So if I'm smarter when I'm making my test, I'll do something like this. As to, word, as, to, uh, as to not have to throw out a problem, <laughs> right? What would the appropriate k be then? I think Jess is right. I think it's eight dimensional because each one of those z's has got two real parameters in it, right? The real and imaginary parts, those are separate. They're independent. So we could write this as like, you know, x11 plus i y11, um, x12 plus i y12, z, ah, good grief, x21 plus i y21, and then x22 plus i y22, where the xij and yij are reals. Marker lived a good life, but it's over. <clears throat> so what would be the appropriate k? What's the dimension of this as a real vector space? It's 4 times k, right? So k equals 2? Yeah, 2, right? So I want to say psi of Z11, Z12, Z21, Z22 as above, right? What would I what would I set it equal to? 
I want, what, four rows, two columns. So, I mean, there's lots of different choices, but pretty much you just can fill in the parameters that you see in the domain into the range appropriately, and then that's an isomorphism, right? If I just said find, yeah. Now, there are many choices, of course, right? I guess this would be kind of my, I don't know. I mean, it's, it, again, there's lots of choices here. So the grader is going to have to think about it. Don't worry, though. I'm the grader. I'll figure it out. So you can easily prove that that is one to one and on to, and in fact, linear. If you want us to prove that one of my is you say, like, find the isomorphism and show it as an isomorphism. And show it as an isomorphism, yeah. Or maybe I'd ask you to prove a theorem. Theorem. If psi is a mapping from, say, beta v to beta w, where beta v and beta w are bases for v and w over f such that the dimension of V equals the dimension of W. And let me call this thing psi tilde. And psi is the linear extension of uh, psi tilde. Then psi is an isomorphism. This is a theorem which is useful to use in the construction of isomorphisms. Here I've used parameters. The other thing that you can do is just find a basis for the alleged, um, I mean, the V and the W, which are alleged to be isomorphic. Find a basis for one, find a basis for the other. If they have the same number of things with respect to a given field, you're, you're kind of done. You just map one basis to the other, just preserving ordering like the first to the first, second to the second, third to the third, and so forth. That will, in fact, um, sorry, I, I neglected something. Psi of uh, vi equals to wi. And of course, fine. Now, now, you, now you got me. A bunch more writing. And some of my other writing is now superfluous. How do you define the linear extension off a basis? How's that defined? What's the formula? We let psi of x equal to what? Sub i equals 1 to n of what? x sub i, v sub i. And then by definition, this is the sum i equals 1 to n of xi um, psi tilde of vi. That's, that's the definition of linear extension. It just says that you assume linearity and you're stuck with the values of the extended map where it's already defined. In particular, here the basis. Then that's what, well, this is by definition wi, right? And then you could. You could, I suppose, prove that that's a bijection. How would you calculate its kernel? So what would that be? That would be x such that what? Psi of x, which is, by the way, equal to this is equal to 0. What does that say? <coughs> if the wi's are a basis for w, right, you got a linear combination of the basis equal to 0, so what do the coefficients have to be by linear independence of the basis? 0, right. So 
so therefore psi is injective. I claim that you can prove linearity from the formula. How would you show it's surjective? But how do you show surjectivity? Let w be an element of w, right? Then there exists what? Like y1, y2, da da da, yn in f such that what? w is equal to the sum i equals 1 to n of y i w i, right? Because the w i's are a basis for w. So can you tell me psi of what equals to w? Fill in the blank. What element of the domain maps to that? Here, I'll put you out of your suffering. We just use the same coordinates, right? It's just yi, vi. Piggybacking off the calculation I did over there. So this maps to that. So there you go. That's most of the proof that if we map a basis to a basis, you get a nice morphism. So use that if I ask you to find one, if it's helpful. Other times, it's helpful to do this thing. I mean, it kind of depends on the example. I'll, I'll shut up anyway. You guys have other questions. Let me not spend all of class working some weird problem. <laughs> you need to know the basic definitions, right? You need to know linear independence. You need to know what's spanning. What's a, what's a finite generating set? What's the difference between a generating set and a basis? What is the big difference between a generating set and a basis? Can you guys tell me? Exactly. A basis has to be linearly independent. So every basis is a, generating, a finite generating set for a vector space. But not every finite generating set is a basis, because not every finite generating set is linearly independent. <coughs> but what can we always do to a finite generating set? What's one of our theorems? We can always remove vectors from it, right? Make it into a basis, right? Another important theorem to know about, we can always take a subspace, right? We can take a basis for the subspace, and we can adjoin vectors outside the subspace until we get a basis for the total space, right? That's another good theorem to know about. What, what theorems should you know how to prove in here? a great question. So I read back through the notes and I think, you know, generically speaking, for the most part, if it took me like a solid page to prove something, probably not appropriate for an hour test, right? However, <coughs> the thing that I did right after that might be, or some sub part of that might be, right? Um, so like, I think a good example of this would be the one I spent like a whole class to prove. I started before class and I wrote and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and I wrote, and we, this is the, this replacement lemma that we can, um, we have linear dependence, right? If you have, if you can generate a vector space with m vectors, n vectors rather, n as in nanu nanu, and um, if then you take a, if you take a set of m vectors where m is greater than n, then that set is necessarily linearly dependent. I hope, that if, after you've worked enough problems, I hope that is just glaringly obvious to you at this point. But we had to work pretty hard to prove it, and it used induction, it was rather involved. That's not a fair test question, right? But the thing that comes right after it is, given that theorem, prove that you know, any two bases have the same number, of, same number of elements, right? Because what you do is you just say, OK, if I have a, a linearly independent, right? If I have a linearly independent uh, generating set with n elements, and I take another linearly independent generating set with m elements, where m is greater than n, and then I apply that theorem I just talked about, you get linear dependence, which is a contradiction. So that n must be equal to m. 
So the proof of dimension being well defined follows easily from that replacement lemma. Although of course I wouldn't ask you to prove ask to, I wouldn't ask you to prove the full replacement lemma in here. That would be just that would be just I don't want to grade that. You don't want to write that. But there's lots of things that come after it, which are nice, like not not such hard things. I would say generically speaking, most of the things that I've stated about linear transformations make nice little standalone test questions, right? Like prove, for example, prove the image of a subspace is a subspace. Or prove the inverse image of a subspace is a subspace. Or prove that a, a linear transformation is one to one if and only if the kernel is zero. Sometimes I like to just split off one direction of that. Because I can kind of tell if you understand what you're doing if I just check the implication or the reverse implication there. Um, there is one proof that's kind of like a page long that really stands out to me as something I might ask conceivably, possibly. That's the rank nullity theorem. Um, the one that starts with, you've got t from v to w. So what do you do? You look at kernel. <coughs> the kernel of t is subspace of v, and um, you let, uh, you know, v1, v2, da da da, vk, be basis for the kernel. And then you extend, you extend to, um, say, beta, <clears throat> I mean, notations vary. Let's say w1, w2, that, 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 that. Um, let me call them w bars. Um, w bar, how many are there? Mm, I already got k of them here, though. <coughs> I, guess the, well, I guess you're like, well, you never said what the dimension of v was. Fair enough. Mention v equals to n, right? So how many of them are there? n minus k, right? Right, where w bar i is not an element, right, of the kernel of t. I won't do the whole thing, but then what you do is you prove that the, um, the set of images, all right, of the, basically you can, you can show, the next thing is, you show that, that if you look at the set T of W bar I, I equals one to N minus K, um, is linearly independent and spans the range of t. All right. There's no use in the, the the argument I'm thinking of doesn't use coordinates or anything. It's just pure. You extend the basis, and you construct things from outside the span. You show linear independence of this, like I'm saying. It's it's proof two in my notes that I'm thinking of. And then what? Well, then you argue that this is a basis for the range. And of course, that is by construction a basis for the kernel. And so the dimension of v is what? It's n, but that's also equal to k plus n minus k, which is, by the way, the dimension of the kernel of t plus the dimension of the range of t. What are these called? We also use a symbol null t or rank or rkt nullity or the rank. That particular theorem, I think the proof of is so natural that I would like you to understand it. Even though it's like a, well, it's a half a page. It's not really a page. That's worth trying to understand. It has all of, like, most of the essential elements of the interesting proofs we've done. It, it has the study of images under a linear transformation. It has a check of linear independence in a slightly non-trivial, but not super non-trivial way. Um, it's just a, it's a very nice theorem.
is what I'm talking about. And the result is so important. Like, this is everything as you're studying linear transformations, trying to decide, are they injective? Are they surjective? What's the deal, right? Because this basically says that once you know the dimension of the domain for the linear transformation, and once you know one of those two things, you know the other one without further calculation, right? So if you're just asked questions about dimension, that's huge. <clears throat> because kernel's pretty easy to calculate sometimes, and range is pretty easy to calculate other times. Any questions about particular solutions to homework? One thing I haven't talked about in here yet, well, not face-to-face -face anyway. I mean, I put a solution up. I hope you look at it. But we were looking to find how to construct, remember, the um, solution, which a linear manifold so given a linear manifold, how do you find a, um, oh, come on, where's my, I, I, if I could find my own solution, that would be something. Did you guys get the announcement I, I made about looking at the old test too? I didn't make this announcement. Quiz two? Oh. I didn't say to look at test two. Oh. Hmm. Well, you can look at test two, too. Here's test two. It's kind of sort of relevant. Um, th there's, there's one thing that's out, obviously, which would be problem nine. We haven't talked about quotients yet, nor direct sums. We haven't studied the structure of subspaces just yet. I mean, we've studied subspaces, but we haven't studied how to take subspaces and put them together and make a total space. That's another chapter in the, in, in the story we're telling this semester. We haven't, we, haven't, we haven't really studied that yet. But a lot of the rest of um, you know, test two is, is relevant. Like, here's one. It's fun. Let t from v to w be a linear transformation, and v is equal to the span, and w equal to that span. So I have 3 and 3, apparently. You notice um, that I have not told you, right? Did I even say, oh, I said they're non-zero. If I don't say that, that changes things. I didn't tell you that these vectors are linearly independent, right? So it could be, it could be that v is one, two, or three-dimensional. And the same is true for W. W could be one, two, or three-dimensional. And depending on those eventualities, you get different answers for different cases. So if the dimension of V is one, then the kernel of T can be either one-dimensional and the range zero-dimension, or the kernel can be zero-dimensional and the range one-dimensional, right? If the dimension of V was two, you either got two, zero, one, one, or zero, two. If the dimension of V was three, these are your possibilities. Although I think that well, no, no, the, um, the range doesn't have to be equal to W, right? W is the codomain, so I'm not restricted by the fact that W is more than zero dimensional, right? Because the W, um, one, two, three are non-zero, right? So the dimension of W is at least one. I think that sound effect is, is my time's up. Can you guys watch the Oscars? You are good people. I, s I also did not watch the Oscars because I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the people who, what are they, the people who read other people's words for money? I mean, why is he so impressed? They're, they're actors, who cares? I mean, how did actor get to be such an, a prestigious job in this world? It's sad. Sorry. I'm sorry, some of you are probably aspiring actors. This is just your way station on your journey to California where you're going to make it big, I, I know. <laughs> or maybe some of you are in the theater department here. I don't know. We have, a, we have an aspiring theater department here, right? Mr. Mr. Tower gave us all that money. The Tower Theater we have. I digress. Um, obviously. Oh, OK, so I'm back on test two solution again. Ah. I was trying to look at mission three. 
By the way, I will post the rest of the solution to Mission 5. I have it worked out. I just, my scanner at home is broke, so I had to wait till I get back to school to scan it, and I just haven't posted it. I will post it soon. The problems from Curtis are really fun. It's, I mean, they're simple, but not simple. Yes? No. Wait a minute, I said that it wouldn't be on this test? Did I say that? Coordinate change? Oh, okay. It's not on the test then. But I might ask a question about coordinates, just one coordinate system. But not how to change them. Fair enough. Thank you. I've forgotten about that. That is a very helpful comment because I do want to be true to what I say. But I'm also very forgetful. Don't take advantage of this. Like if you tell me that... Well, there are various things you could tell me that I would know. You know, don't don't be, don't uh, don't use my weakness against me. Um, don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. You know. Sorry. <laughs> my blue shirt is looking nice. I don't get it. Can you guys tell me which problem it was where we had to find the e system of equations which um, produced the thing as a subspace? I don't remember where it was. I think it was mission four. It was at the end. By the way, this is still, like Adam, you said you figure out how to solve this, problem 64. So if you want the solution to that, you'll have to see Adam. The 64 here, like there's a gap in my solution to 64 which I have not yet fixed. I, I, and I don't. I I, start, I tried that for about an hour. I couldn't see my way through it. How to show that the um, a prime b prime c prime is linearly dependent on a b c? There's. I think it's just raw algebra. I couldn't see my way through it, sadly, but truthfully. Um, okay, so look, I actually found a. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure if I could somehow um, work modulo my children, I might get it. But, um, you know, that um, you're, you, you, you can't get rid of your children. It, you shouldn't try either. Um, let's see here. Oh, I thought of many things I can't say right now. Let's see here. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. OK, um, <clears throat> so here's a homogeneous system. And the solution set is generated by that one, that one, that one, and that one. Find the homogeneous system which has this as a solution set. And then find a, um, a manifold, a linear manifold, with, with given vectors in the directing set, the so-called tangent space, you could say, with base point 1, 1, 1. So, I'm sure, I mean, he has an example in Curtis, right? But I, I've kind of, if you read this solution, you'll see I more or less give you a general algorithm to do it. What you do is just kind of look at what you want, which is you want to solve, you know, like A, AV1 equals 0, AV2 equals 0, AV3 equals 0, a, AV4 equals 0, right? But if you think about A, it's coefficient matrix, it's made of rows, right? Like A1, A2, A3, A4, whatever, however many you need. So what, you're, what you want then is for the J throw, you want the j-throw times v1 to be 0. You want the j-throw times v2 to be 0. You want the j-throw times v3 to be 0. You want the j-throw times v4 to be 0. Right? In other words, you could write it like this as one system. You can you, uh, transpose that sucker. And then you've got something that you know what to do. See, because the v's are given, the a is what you don't know. All of a sudden, you've got a system that you can solve by just transposing the problem, right? writing it down symbolically, what you're trying to do, then transpose it. And so essentially what you can do is just solve the find, the, find the null space. You find the null space to the transpose of the vectors you're given, put into a matrix. 
and then this thing will give you um, <coughs> a way to see what the equation should have been. Like in this one, I figure out that if I had this was my jth row, I should have these relations between the, um, the components, or, or the, the rows rather. No, the components, j1, j3, j4, and this. And so I <coughs> then can write down the system of equations, which I was looking for, something like this, for example. Um, we'll take those four vectors. And you can go back and check, basically, that that matrix, when you multiply the given four vectors that you have, were given this problem, do give you back zero. What you're really doing is you're just looking. Those four vectors are not independent, by the way. They're linearly dependent. But what you're really doing is you're just looking for vectors which are perpendicular to the given vectors. And once you find those, you can construct the equation based on those perpendicular vectors. Um, anyway, I just wanted to tell you guys, you can skip this for now. OK, so don't, don't worry about this. This actually fits better with our later discussion of um, um, inner product spaces and such. There, it's part of a larger story. So we'll just leave it for there. I'm just telling you, you can skip this one. Because I think most of you didn't get it. And I'd really like you to focus your attention on how do I prove linear independence? You know, and like I said, those basic theorems about linear and transformations and such. Yes, sir? Uh, can we do 69 Is that what I'm currently looking at? I mean, I would like you to know what a linear manifold is, but that inverse question is, too is, is not the best question, if that makes sense to you. Oh, yeah, 69 is actually a reasonable question. Um, so this question was to show that the sum of two subspaces was once more a subspace. All right, and that, that, that actually is, that's the part I'm saying is, like, that's a good quest test question. Or the question to show that x plus w is the smallest subspace which contains the union is also a good question. And when they're separated, put together, it's kind of not something I want to grade. Um, <clears throat> so to start with, and I guess I should, I'm kind of burying the lead here. What do I want you to know for this test? I want you to have a clear understanding of what a vector space is. I want you to understand the role the field plays, right? It's so very important that you are able to say, oh, this isn't a subspace because it doesn't have zero in it. Or this isn't a subspace because if I multiply by a negative, it's outside, right? I mean, you should be able to spot counterexamples of subspaces through, I mean, so the main purpose of knowing the axioms of the vector space is not so that you rattle all 10 of them off in order as labeled with correct ordering, which would be ever so much fun for me to grade. Um, no, I mean, I want you to know them. You don't have to know them by number, but you need, need to know the content of them. So that if I give you something and I say, is this a subspace? You can say, well, no, it fails this axiom, um, whatever that axiom might be appropriately. So w on the more positive side of things, what do you need to know? You need to know subspace test theorem, right? Non-empty, closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication is a subspace. What's our other even greedier theorem? Yes, very good. We can, w we can make that into a one-step test if we check for a linear combination rather than just an additive or a homogeneous combination. Um, but what other than that? Greedier still. Right, if it's a span, it's a subspace. Game over, end of story. By the way, what's the basis for the zero space? I don't say this enough, but it's what? Space. Empty set, not null space. Empty set, empty set. What is the null space of a matrix? What's the range of a matrix? Trick question, we never defined range of a matrix. Null space of a matrix is the set. I mean, we could say this, the null space of A is the kernel of the linear transformation induced by A. And the column space of A is the range of the linear transformation induced by A. This is for A. In F M by N. I think I just got distracted off my other topic. Sorry. Let me go back. Subspaces. <laughs> so, subspace test. It's a span. I'm done. Right? 
beyond that, what? That's, that's pretty much it. Well, I mean, there are other things. If you can identify something as being the kernel of a given linear transformation, it's a subspace. If you can identify something as being the range of a given linear transformation, we know that's a subspace. That's a theorem we had, right? Apparently, if this is true, if it's the sum of two subspaces, as described above here, it's a subspace, right? <coughs> so what's this proof? What's this proof about? So we're defining u plus w to be a new set, right? It's the set of all sums of x plus y, where x is taken from u and y is taken from w. To prove that's a subspace, I need to show it's non-empty, it's closed under addition, it's closed under scalar multiplication. Then by the subspace test theorem, it's a subspace. And that's what I do. First of all, 0 plus 0 is 0. Hence, 0 is up in here. Hence, it's non-empty. Then um, I don't follow Adam's lead. I'm, I'm, I'm less lazy and more, more righty. Or do I? Oh, I decided midstream that I'm going to take alpha times z plus w. Um, <laughs> and uh, oh, I think I was using c, and then I thought I thought uh, c's c's not the greatest choice for a scalar in this problem for some reason. Um, so yeah, a plus c, b plus d. So this plus that is alpha times that plus b. But this, because u is a subspace, is again in u. And this, because w is a subspace, is again in w. Hence, this is of the form. And by the way, alpha times this is again in u. So what we're looking at is something in u plus something in w. Therefore, it's in u plus w. My thinking is guided by what? The definition of the subspace I'm trying to prove is a subspace. <coughs> I know, <laughs> but that would that would require looking at settings in Windows 10, and that's 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 even more boring. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, as we have discussed, it would have been bonus points, <laughs> but this is an offer. This is an I will change the settings for you for bonus points. But if you had done it without asking if there have been bonus points, it would have been conceivable that there would have been such. Having asked for them, now it's impossible. <laughs> That's helping. <laughs> it's still out there. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we, Lorenzo's, Lorenzo's bidding you. <laughs> She'll do it for less bonus points. Very funny. Okay. Um, are you guys clear on the proof? The, 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 and then the thing that goes on here is if you have U, U union W, right? This is the set theoretic union. So if you think about this, what is this like? If you take two subspaces in the plane, maybe this one and that one, right? So span a V1, span a V2. The union of these two is literally just those lines. That is not a subspace. Because if you take the sum of two things on these lines, you don't, you're not back on the lines again. You could be out here somewhere. So union's definitely not a subspace for lots of reasons. But you can show that u plus w is the smallest subspace which contains the union. That's what this argument's about. So I, I, I basically, I show that this is a subset um, of w and then what else? So I show x. Um, I show the unions in there, and then what? I take an arbitrary subspace H, which also contains the union, and then argue that, what do I argue? I think I argue that H is, H contains U plus W, all right? which then shows you that u plus w is smaller than another set subspace, which also contains the union. So other questions? 
I will tell you this again, I don't mean to be foreboding or anything. I think you guys are on the right track, generally speaking. I know we had some trouble on quiz one, but that's, you know, that's what quiz one is for. It's to try to help you to figure out how to study in here. Hopefully that helps some. Um, but it was the case a few semesters ago that I, I didn't award a, an A in linear algebra that, that happened. It, it's a true story. I'm not, not happy about that. I don't want that to happy again, be, happen again, but I have faith that if I was to put, say, this question right here, this one before, this right here is the very question that kept me from giving an A or saying, allowing myself to say someone had earned an A, let's say that in linear algebra, the fact that no one could solve this problem on the final was profoundly disturbing to me. I felt like I had failed as a professor, that no one had learned how to do this. So here we are faced with the question of showing the intersection of subspaces, again, a subspace. So what do you do? Suppose something's in the intersection, right? In fact, suppose two things. Suppose x and y are in the intersection. Let C be a scalar. Then x and y are in both subspaces, right? So Cx plus y is in subspace 1. And Cx plus y is in subspace 2. Why? Because subspace 1 and subspace 2 are subspaces. They are closed under addition and scalar multiplication. Consequently, Cx plus y is in both of them. That means what? By set theory, they're in the intersection. Consequently, as you can easily show, zero is in the intersection, so it's not empty. By the subspace test theorem, we have that the intersection of subspaces is once more a subspace. As you see, I was able to tell that to you without writing even. It's that easy of a problem. Now, I don't believe you guys are where that other class was. I think you're way ahead of them, light years ahead of them. So I'm not worried about not giving an A in here. I'm just, it's just a, it's a true and disturbing story I tell. I'm not happy about it, but I can't deny the past. <sighs> should I forget the past? I should forget the past. Why are we here? There's a Trump rally in the state. We could be there now. <laughs> Who knows what kinds of new insulting new insults he's bringing for today? <laughs> I'm sorry, but throwing the, the water throwing involving Rubio is very funny. That's that's funny stuff. You don't know about this? Uh oh. Ooh, well, a politician is basically like an actor who couldn't make it. <laughs> so they're like a little bit lower than, a, than an actor. Okay. So it's something like, I mean, we're all created in the image of God and we're all equal under his sight, but setting that aside. <laughs> I was about to draw some sort of number line involving garbage collectors, politicians. <laughs> And uh, actually, gar garbage collectors are good people. They're solid to the earth right there. I'll tell you what, those garbage collectors, so they're good people. You know what's the difference between garbage men and politicians? Garbage men, garbage men actually do something. Oh, and they actually take out the trash. It's true. If we could actually get people to do that in Washington, then we'd have something, right? I'm sorry, I digress. Any questions about the test? Well, if you have any, I have office hours tomorrow. Come ask me, email me if you want. Make sure you know your definitions. Your definitions are your lifeblood. I will ask you to state definitions. It's very likely I ask you to state the definition of like dimension or linear independence, stuff like that, linear transformation, kernel, range, image. Yes. But mostly the part I ask. Thank you.